So as Hannah was saying, my interest primarily is in respiratory viral infections and human, human immunity against those. Um, so actually in this talk, I'll be giving quite a wide ranging introductory um, session about human challenge in general and touching on respiratory viruses, but not really talking about the SARS-CoV-2 work that we've done. But then uh, at the beginning of the discussion panel, I'll show you a little bit more of the data from the SARS-CoV-2 human challenge study, because I think that brings together some of the ethical safety and study conduct themes um, in, in very sort of sharp relief. So uh, in, during this first 25 minutes, what I'm going to do is try and get us all up to speed about what human infection challenge is. And I, I appreciate that some people may not have experienced these studies uh, very much. And others, I know certainly some people in the room work with these all the time. So I apologize if, um, if I'm preaching to the converted uh, to some of you. But what I really want to do is highlight some of the unique strengths of human challenge as a study design, and then show you several examples of what we have been able to learn from human challenge studies. Um, a little bit on pathogenesis, immunity and transmission, but for the purposes of, of uh, what we're here for today, I'm really going to focus a little bit more on how these types of studies can be used to accelerate vaccine development. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about ethics and safety because uh, Peter in the next session will be talking about those, but I will talk a little bit about the limitations and bottlenecks and how we're thinking about moving the field forward going into the future. So what is human infection challenge? So first of all, you may also have heard the term controlled human infection model, which is uh, this here, CHIM. Um, these are studies where volunteers are deliberately inoculated with um, virulent pathogens. Um, these pathogens are um, need to be well defined, and this these types of studies are conducted in controlled settings. So um, you'll be aware that that um, deliberate inoculation of people, participants, and volunteers has been conducted for a long time, many hundreds of years. Um, there there are these sort of uh, sorry. Um, these sort of classic examples, John Hunter, who inoculated um, willing or unwilling volunteers with material from um, from genital ulcers to prove Cox postulates, um, and also Barry Marshall, who proved through self-experimentation drinking a flask of Helicobacter pylori that that was associated with gastritis and, in fact, the cause of gastritis. Um, so those types of studies have been done for a long time to, to understand pathogenesis and the role of infectious organisms in disease. And in the context of respiratory viral infections, we probably have about almost 100 years of experience now. And particularly in units such as the Common Cold Research Unit, which was uh, in existence in the UK. These are some pictures from, from that unit on the right. Um, the, the, a number of different respiratory viruses were tested in hundreds of volunteers. And these really seminal studies allowed us to understand the effects of virus strain and dose, how the route of delivery alters clinical outcomes, as well as some work on understanding transmission here. And as the technology is developed, protection. And you can see that now there are many, many pathogens um, uh, which have been developed as human challenge models um, from respiratory viruses to um, parasites and enteric, path uh, enteric bacteria. So really a very wide range of, of models are in existence today. So the key strengths of human challenge, I've tried to summarize in this slide. And I think for me, the first one, and possibly the most important, is that you define the pathogen, the strain, and the dose. And this is unique in human challenge. In any kind of field trial, you cannot establish the exact pathogen or mix of pathogens and strains that a, a study participant or a patient was exposed to. You have no idea about the dose that they received or the environment that they received that in. And those factors really do contribute to variation in clinical outcome. Um, by defining these, you, you immediately control for many of those unmeasurable confounders. And together with carefully selecting our study participants, um, the models are designed to cause a consistently high infection rate. That means that very small numbers of participants are needed 
to power studies of efficacy. So um, these studies are increasingly being used to better understand efficacy early during clinical development of a product um, to act as a potential stage gauge to up and down select potential candidates for more uh, costly, more risky, and, uh, and uh, more difficult to conduct large-scale phase three studies. From the point of view of understanding pathogenesis, correlates of protection, um, and, uh, and mechanisms of protection, the other important point is that we're able to assess these individuals at the beginning, middle, and end of infection, including the, the pre-infection period and the often short period between virus exposure and, uh, and development of symptoms, which you can't really capture in any other kind of study design. So the very accurately defined endpoint, coupled with the very accurately defined stimulus, allows us to identify not only static protective factors like antibodies, relatively static, um, but also dynamic host protective factors like the production of, uh, of soluble mediators, cytokines, chemokines, and also um, T cells and, and other cellular protective mechanisms. So um, in my lab, we, uh, before SARS-CoV-2 came along, worked mainly on RSV and flu virus. And this is a, a fairly typical schematic from one of our studies. You can see a, one of our study clinicians inoculating a participant. And you can see uh, that following extensive screening, we are able to take a large number of samples immediately prior to virus inoculation. That includes not only blood, but also a wide variety of upper respiratory tract samples. And in some individuals, we can also take uh, lower respiratory tract samples through bronchoscopy, which is what this is. And this allows us to um, access uh, anatomical compartments, which may be critical in determining the outcome of an infection, but which normally in field studies are, are really not systematically um, assessed. The other point to notice about the study design is how frequently we can, um, we can take follow-up samples. So because these uh, individuals are potentially infectious after they've received uh, these respiratory viruses, we quarantine them for up to 10 days. And during that time, we can sample them sometimes twice or three times a day and get really unprecedentedly granular detail about their response to the infection. Um, and obviously, we follow them up and can follow them up to look at long-term um, memory and clinical outcomes. So this is just uh, some example data from a flu study, which we conducted a few years, 2009 H1N1 uh, flu virus. And we, uh, we inoculated in this study 63 individuals. Um, and important to note that we, in flu challenge studies, you need to zero screen your uh, individuals in advance because we know from a lot of historical and field data that high levels of circulating antibodies correlate very strongly with protection. So um, in order to achieve an, a consistently high infection rate, you need to uh, do some pre-selection. But in these individuals, you can see that uh, just over half of them became infected, and the vast majority of those developed flu-like symptoms, including a proportion with fever. So this contrasts with RSV, and um, if you're familiar with, with the RSV field, it's been plagued not only by safety issues from those formerly in in inactivated uh, vaccinated children back in the 1960s, but also with questions about immunogenicity. RSV has multiple mechanisms to uh, reduce the generation or limit the generation of effective uh, human host immunity and memory. And so it's been very difficult to establish correlate protection, and um, we all are susceptible to recurrent RSV infection, despite the fact that we have all quite high levels of antibody. Um, and, uh, and every two or three years, I would expect all of us to have symptomatic RSV infection. So in this study, um, we didn't have to pre-screen anybody. So these people have a, a, a range of antibodies. And uh, in spite of that, just over half of them became infected. Uh, RSV is a less, my, a less uh, symptomatic disease than, than flu in general. And so uh, a larger proportion of asymptomatic individuals were uh, seen in this study. The other thing you can do in human challenge is that you can very carefully assess uh, a number of readouts which are not so easy to do in the field. So 
Um, if you look at the first row, you can see in the flu-challenged individuals, they develop symptoms, and you can track these symptoms through self-reported symptom diaries or, uh, or some objective measures such as mucus weight and so on. Um, these people develop symptoms almost straight away within 24 hours. This peaks around day four. Um, they're mainly upper respiratory tract, but also some systemic symptoms. And these correlate very closely in timing with viral load from the upper respiratory tract, which also peaks around the same time. In RSV, you have this um, two to three day incubation period, which is which is interesting and special, but I won't have time to talk about it today. Um, but then you see a similar peaking of symptoms uh, associated with the viral load. So these are all um, measures which uh, are very difficult to assess when you are only intermittently seeing individuals um, who present as soon as once they notice that they start having symptoms in a field study. So in our hands, we've done a lot of work looking at correlates and mechanisms of protection. So um, I said with RSV that you don't, uh, that, that serum neutralizing antibodies are not a good correlate of protection against infection, um, although it is a good correlate of protection against severe disease. And so um, in line with that, in our model, you can see that the people who got infected really don't have uh, substantially lower levels of serum neutralizing antibodies than the people who resisted infection. But in fact, when you measure the IgA in their nose, so the antibodies in their nasal lining fluid, then you do start seeing a significant difference between those groups and you can start modeling a sort of predictive model of whether somebody will get infected or not uh, based on their nasal uh, antibody titer. We've also been able to uh, look at T cells. So we're interested in resident memory T cells, which are a specialist uh, subset of uh, T cells which uh, live in the tissues after an infection and are specialized to respond very quickly. And we've shown that these correlate with reduced severity of disease. And you can see here, this is a bronchial biopsy. All of the green dots are CD8 T cells, which come into the, the lining of the, of the airway following infection. And finally, these models also allow the discovery of previously unrecognized mechanisms of, mechanisms of protection. So in this study, we used uh, transcriptomics, so RNA sequencing of tissue from the nose. And we found that there was a difference between people who became infected and uninfected on the transcriptional level. And the difference was mainly in neutrophil inflammation-related genes, which was a real surprise, previously unappreciated, because neutrophils are classically associated with protection or responses to bacteria. And in fact, what we saw was that people with um, more neutrophilic inflammation in their nose were more susceptible to RSV infection and were unable to upregulate the uh, very rapid antiviral response needed to block the onset of the viral infection. Okay, so uh, that's all great for the pathogenesis and understanding of disease and immunity, but we're all here to think about vaccines. And, and um, obviously we know that the, uh, the clinical vaccine development pipeline is fraught with risk. It's very expensive. Um, and there have been some estimates, you know, of, of the cost uh, of getting up to the end of phase two development. Um, but uh, if you factor in all the failed candidates, there have been some other estimates which have been shown these really sort of staggering costs of um, those failed phase two and phase three trials, which come even at the end of a very promising um, uh, you know, vaccine development uh, path. And um, one good example of this is uh, the Novavax RSV vaccine, which a few years ago uh, was um, tested in a phase three trial in older adults and failed at that point, which is a, a real setback for the field. So how do we uh, de-risk this? How do we reduce the, the chances of these late stage failures and really push through the, the vaccine candidates, which are most likely to give us um, positive results? And um, uh, in the face of you know, relatively limited phase three capacity. So while animal models are very useful for many things, in some settings, they are very poor at predicting um, the, the efficacy of vaccines uh, further down the line. 
and um, human observational studies, as I've already said, and, and field phase three studies are uh, confounded by many factors, which requires them to be powered with extremely high numbers of individuals, um, and, uh, and, and still the, the resulting data are not always completely interpretable. So this is, uh, you know, these problems have been appreciated for a long time. And, and, uh, and so controlled human infection models have been developed to try and address some of these. And, and obviously the first formal testing of a vaccine was by Edward Jenner shown here. Um, and now you can see that over time, there are increasing numbers of clinical trials, um, using human challenge to, um, to assess potential vaccine candidates. So this is a, a from a review by um, uh, uh, Kanta Subha Rao. And you can see that very simply what you do is you enroll your participants in your challenge study. You randomize them to either receive your vaccine or placebo or comparator. And then you, after a fixed amount of time, you challenge them all with an identical amount of the same virus or other pathogen. And then you monitor them for clinical outcomes. And... Uh, the, the benefit of this is that you can very early in clinical development um, derive some proof of concept of efficacy with an efficacy readout. Um, and this is particularly valuable for difficult pathogens where we are uncertain about the mechanism or correlates of protection. And I'm going to talk a little bit more with some examples um, going forward. Because these studies are generally quite well standardized, you can perform head-to-head -head or quasi head to head trials. So if, uh, ideally you run different vaccine candidates or different formulations, dose levels and so on within the same study. But even if you have to do it in different studies, there is more comparability because of the standardization of the model compared with field trials. This allows you, as I said, to up and down select vaccine candidates. And in some cases, it has been extremely helpful in vaccine licensure. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. So um, if you go back to this graph, you can see that uh, Plasmodium falciparum or malaria challenge studies have really taken off in the last few decades. And it, malaria challenge studies are really cited as uh, one of the main um, uh, examples of how challenge has human challenge has uh, accelerated vaccine development. So you'll all be aware of the clinical burden of plasmodium falciparum, the cause of severe malaria, and the fact that it's a difficult immune target. It's a very complex organism with lots of surface proteins. Um, it has a multi-stage life cycle, and and the correlates of protection are are fairly unclear. And so uh, developing vaccines has really required a, a slow, iterative process. And the first attempts were in the 1980s with a protein subunit called the circumsporozoic protein, which is shown up here. And this was shown uh, on its own to not be very immunogenic, um, was later fused to the hepatitis B surface antigen. And then um, that, that, was, uh, that assembles into nanoparticles. And, and still that was not shown to be extremely uh, immunogenic. And I think the role of human challenge has been to try uh, with those, uh, to, to accelerate those iterative steps to get to a, a more clinically uh, useful vaccine candidate. So with, um, so with the initial malaria challenge studies, these required transmission by mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes are infected uh, through a, a feed, and then they are put on the surface of volunteers' skin where they bite the volunteers. And, uh, and these studies are designed to cause essentially a 100% infection rate through optimization of the number of, uh, of mosquitoes put onto the skin. Um, the readout in these models is generally uh, detection of the parasite in blood, so parasitemia, either by microscopy initially, but more recently by PCR, and not, and this is not a disease-causing model. More recently, there have been developments, so you don't need the mosquitoes anymore, you can directly inject sporozoites into, into the blood, uh, which gives you a, a little, little bit more control. So, um, this is probably one of the more important um, malaria challenge studies, which um, 
gave confidence to progress to the, the, the um, pivotal phase three studies of RTSS. So um, you can see from the consort diagram, uh, first of all, that there were relatively small numbers of individuals in each group. So this was comparing RTSS with two different adjuvants, uh, which were shown to be required to increase the, the efficacy or the immunogenicity at that stage, compared with controls. And there were only around 50, 30 individuals in each group. Um, and uh, by the time that these had finished all their, their vaccinations, there were only 36, 44, and 24 in these three arms. And what you can see with even those very small numbers of individuals is a clear statistical difference between the, um, the control, the infection rate and the con control in red compared with the ASO2 um, uh, adjuvanted RTSS and uh, performing best, the ASO1 uh, adjuvanted um, uh, uh, candidate. And approximately this gave a vaccine efficacy of 50% for the ASO1 adjuvanted vaccine. Um, the other additional benefit of these studies, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, is, is that they can help to further establish correlates and mechanisms of protection. And so in these studies, um, antibodies were measured and it was clearly seen that the um, that the SO1 uh, adjuvanted vaccine induced higher levels of circulating antibodies. So put that into context. Um, on the left is is just a summary of um, Italian studies which were done using malaria up to uh, 2011. And uh, you can see that here is the uh, CSP, so the RTSS candidate, which gave around a 30 percent. Um, protect, protection rate, uh, vaccine efficacy rate in, uh, in a number of different studies. You can see how many studies were done to establish that. And then all of these vaccine candidates which were tested where there was zero protection. And so all of those were thrown out and no time was there, therefore wasted on, um, on doing more of those studies. Importantly, RTSS was then taken on into field efficacy trials. And uh, I think this is why malaria is cited as, um, as, as the most robust example of the benefit of CHIM trials uh, in vaccine development, because it was shown in, uh, in a phase 2B study in Mozambique in children, so a different um, target population, that still the vaccine efficacy was around 35% for infection, 48% for severe malaria, and then the pivotal trial of the ASO1 adjuvanted RTSS, um, which showed a similar vaccine efficacy of around 35%. So, um, so we're pretty confident now that uh, malaria challenge is a reasonable predictor of vaccine efficacy, at least for um, uh, the sort of vaccines that we are testing now. And so iterative improvements in new vaccine candidates are almost routinely going through this sort of um, step before being, progressing to further clinical development. So in other pathogen challenge models, um, I think we're a lot further behind, um, but you may have, uh, it's been mentioned several times that um, RSV vaccines are now on the verge of, be, of licensure. Uh, the GSK-1 has already been licensed. And um, as I mentioned earlier on, the, the real, one of the real problems with RSV vaccine development is that we haven't really understood what aspect of um, the immune system we really want to promote in order to induce protection. And so with all this uncertainty, there was some, uh, along with the safety issues, there was some real risk for vaccine developers in progressing to those late stage clinical trials, particularly with the failure of the Novavax vaccine. And so several um, companies have conducted human challenge trials in advance of uh, going forward into phase three um, to give them confidence that their particular product um, made with their particular technology uh, was going to have some biological effect. Um, and so this is just an example of the Pfizer vaccine. So this is a bivalent subunit vaccine. Um, and this is uh, the data from uh, the RSV human challenge study. 
you can see that with only about 30 p people in each arm, so this was the vaccine versus placebo, there was a very robust um, reduction in the viral load in the upper respiratory tract. And this is a symptomatic model. So unlike the malaria model, you can, you can also have clinical readouts in the form of, of symptom scores, which also were much reduced in the vaccinated group. And this provided the, the confidence to go into older adults with the, with the same candidate and also into um, uh, pregnant women. And these have read out very positively on, on the phase three trials. OK, so in general, um, if you talk to regulators, they will be very noncommittal about how you use human challenge data in your licensure package at the end. And so um, almost always human challenge data is provided as supportive information. Um, and in most cases, they have been useful for um, either biotechs or industry to to uh, to progress their their development plan rather than being really essential for vaccine licensure because regulators wherever possible will require you to provide field efficacy data with uh, disease readouts in your target population but there are cases and increasingly i think this is recognized by the regulators as well where it's not going to be possible or it hasn't been possible and it's not going to be possible to, to conduct those pivotal um, field efficacy trials. So the, the only uh, example of that currently is VaxCora, which is a cholera vaccine for travelers. It was essentially impossible to conduct a field trial for cholera because of the prevalence of the disease, the, the uh, regions in which it is uh, more common and so on. And, um, and so a challenge study was conducted, which showed, uh, which, um, included 197 participants with a one-to-one -one vaccine placebo design. Um, and, uh, in the end, 68 people were challenged after 10 days after the vaccination. Um, and there was a vaccine efficacy of about 85%. And because it was recognized that um, it would not be possible to conduct this type of uh, a field efficacy trial in this population, which was healthy young adults in the US, um, the FDA did give approval for this vaccine, but only for travelers. So this is quite a limited use case, um, but it is an example of where uh, efficacy data from challenge alone has been used for licensure and allows us to build forward uh, for other situations. Okay, so um, the, the limitations and bottlenecks, um, obviously there are ethical and safety issues and we're going to come on to that later, I think. Um, but I think from a sort of scientific point of view, there is a, an absolute prioritization of safety in these models. You know, they can only be done in people who are not going to get severely ill, the disease needs to be self-limiting in those people and mild generally um, or entirely treatable before those more severe manifestations occur. And so you don't get severe disease and you can't test vaccines in people with uh, substantial risk factors. Although you know, increasingly people such as us in my group, we're challenging older people with older adults with RSV. So people aged 65 to 75 who are otherwise healthy. Others have been challenging people with asthma and COPD um, to with rhinovirus um, to, to also test uh, interventions. So this means that findings may not always extrapolate to the field. And so we need to be careful about assuming that um, a, a positive signal in a challenge study will automatically lead to a positive signal in the field. And, and perhaps more concerningly for some people, that a negative signal in a challenge study automatically means no uh, efficacy in the field. Because remember, um, the, the challenge studies are mainly looking at infection, whereas in the field, we're more concerned about severe disease. Um, so ideally, human challenge models should be well characterized, and, and that should include validation by comparison with field studies using um, the same vaccines in those different settings um, as in the example of RTSS and with these RSV vaccines. Um, obviously, these uh, studies are difficult to implement, and there is a particular bottleneck with manufacturing of challenge agents. Um, challenge agents have to be uh, manufactured to the highest possible quality, and that's usually to GMP 
standards, although there is some discussion about whether uh, the, the process can be accelerated by um, using GMP standards, but not having to sign off every single piece of GMP paperwork. Um, there is still quite limited global capacity and expertise, and we are working on that um, with with funders and and with partners around the world to try and build that up as a as a sort of um, community of of researchers in human challenge, and um, and there is uh, obviously still a lot of uh, disparity in terms of public and ethical acceptability across the world, um, which also needs a lot of additional work. So to summarize, um, I think uh, human challenge studies are uniquely positioned because they allow us to control the infectious exposure that allows us to interpret host factors involved in protection susceptibility much more robustly than a lot of field study designs. And vaccine efficacy trials can be done using very small numbers of participants, um, which gives you really potentially very useful information um, depending on your particular vaccine and your particular uh, disease, obviously. Um, it's most helpful where there are multiple candidates, which you can't decide between, and where uh, the protective mechanisms are not well defined. And um, there is increasing support from the funders uh, across the world to try and develop uh, these models, address the bottlenecks, and increase their availability, particularly um, moving them from you know, high income settings to more diverse genetic and um, environmental endemic settings. Thanks.